Hello, and welcome to this Nature.com custom webcast titled Critical Considerations for Optimizing Imaging Mass Cytometry. My name is Sarah Hiddleston, and I will be your moderator. Today's webcast is sponsored by Cell Signaling Technology. We'll begin the webcast with a presentation from Noel de Miranda, Principal Investigator of the Immunogenomics Group at Leiden University Medical Center in the Netherlands. This will be followed by a further presentation from Jessica Simendinger, Research and Development Supervisor in the Immunohistochemistry Group at Cell Signaling Technology. We'll then move on to a question and answer session with the speakers. To ask a question, just type it in where it says, type your question here, and then press submit at any point during the webcast and we will answer them today. And now, over to Noel. Hello everyone, my name is Noel de Miranda. I'm the PI of the Immunogenomics Group at the Leiden University Medical Center at the Netherlands. And I would like to share with you our experience in setting up an imaging mass cytometry panel um, in the lab. Most of the work that I will show was actually done by two PhD students, Marika Eiselstein and Natasha de Vries. And there are a few essential collaborators to acknowledge. Fritz Koning, who has published uh, a bunch of work on single cell mass cytometry, and is really very experienced in the technology, as well as Baudivine Leilifeld and Antonio Somarakis, which are really essential in the processing and the analysis of a uh, site of data, including uh, imaging data. So the bulk of our research uh, focuses on colorectal cancer and trying to come up with new immunotherapeutic solutions for the disease. And the reason for that is that it's an extremely common uh, malignancy for which uh, therapeutic options, if you have advanced disease, stage four, uh, they're still quite limited. Colorectal cancer is very interesting uh, from the molecular point of view um, in the sense that you have a, a subset of tumors uh, that really has a, a high amount of non synonymous mutations, and these tumors have uh, a genetic background of deficiency in DNA repair processes, such as the mismatch repair system, uh, or deficiencies in the proofreading domain uh, of uh, polymerase subunits, pol E and uh, pol D1. And there's a large subset of colorectal cancers that does not have that many mutations, which constitutes uh, about 80% of all colorectal cancers. In these, what you will find mostly are chromosomal uh, aberrations. This molecular background uh, correlates to some extent with disease-free survival of the patients, uh, at least in stage two and stage three of the disease. So if you have polymerase mutants or mismatch repair deficient tumors, uh, those patients in general will have a better prognosis than if you have DNA replication repair proficient, uh, which have few non-synonymous mutations as they don't have a, a defective DNA repair system. It is now well accepted that the differences observed in the different patients with a different molecular background can be to some extent uh, explained by the type of immune reaction you see in these tumors. So if you have tumors with a lot of non-synonymous somatic mutations, either being mismatch repair deficient or polymerase deficient, it's very likely that you will see a very robust uh, lymphocytic infiltration uh, of those tumors, while tumors that have few mutations um, are most likely uh, deprived of uh, infiltration by effector uh, lymphocytes. And we also see a similar type of relation uh, between DNA repair defects and the number of coding somatic mutations with responses to state-of-the-art uh, checkpoint blockade immunotherapies or mismatch repair deficient tumors, so the ones that have more mutations uh, respond uh, uh, to checkpoint blockade therapies. Polymerase mutant tumors probably also respond. There's still not a lot of data on those but the indication is that they will respond to checkpoint blockade therapy like anti pd one therapy, while mismatch repair proficient tumors, the ones that have few mutations, uh, are not responsive at all uh, to anti pd one uh, therapy. However, um, there are a few paradoxes in, in colorectal cancer immunology um, that have not yet been fully addressed and which really we're interested in solving. So while mismatch repair deficient tumors uh, they seem to respond well to checkpoint blockade therapy, in particular anti-PD-1 therapy. Uh, the dogma on how 
PD-1, anti-PD-1 or anti-PD-L1 therapy works, tells us that uh, antibodies block the co-inhibitory pathway in T-cells, which counterbalances a positive signal that it received by a T-cell, uh, and specifically a CD8 T-cell when it interacts directly with the tumor, uh, when its T-cell receptor can recognize a, a mutated peptide uh, presented by HLA class 1 in the tumor cell. Um, so what us and several groups have described throughout the years is that the large majority of mismatch repair deficient tumors actually loses uh, HLA class 1 expression, which is an observation which is somewhat difficult um, to reconcile uh, with the dogma on how anti-PD-1 therapy works. Also, I think it's quite surprising if you look at this graph again, uh, that no responses at all are observed in patients with colorectal cancer, which are mismatch repair proficient. Uh, if you look at their median number of coding somatic mutations, they align more or less with breast, endometrial, hepatocellular, or cervical, where you see some type of responses uh, between 5 and 10% of patients. Um, so you would expect that in these tumors, at least 5% of patients would respond to checkpoint blockade therapy, uh, which indicates that it's not only about mutational burden and there might be something in the tumor microenvironment um, um, that is the basis for this for this lack uh, of response. A few years ago, we thought of uh, addressing uh, these questions by employing a broad analysis of the tumor microenvironments in colorectal cancer with a single cell site of panel uh, that at the time comprised 36 antibodies that allowed us uh, to characterize uh, major uh, immune cell subsets, their state of activation, whether they memory naive cells, or whether they're expressing uh, immunomodulatory molecules, adhesion patterns, etc. Um, this paper has been recently published uh, in GUT, so you can dive uh, into it more deeply if you wish in the publication. With this panel, we analyzed not only tumor tissue, but we also analyzed adjacent normal tissue. Uh, tumor-associated lymph nodes uh, and peripheral blood, um, and after making dimensionality reduction uh, analysis, what we immediately saw was that there was a number of immune cell subsets in almost all major lineages, uh, which you can see here, that were specifically found uh, in tumor tissues, uh, revealing uh, the power of mass cytometry as a technique uh, to define specific, specific uh, immune cell subsets. Some of those subsets were not very surprising. They included a tumor resident uh, CD8 positive T cell, as well as tumor resident CD4 positive T cell, ICOS positive uh, regulatory T cells, and somewhat more surprising subsets uh, like gamma deltas, which were also expressing uh, PD-1, and these were specifically found in a mismatch repair deficient tumors, which are currently responding to anti-PD-1 therapy, and their activity uh, is not HLA class 1 restricted, so they could be an effector cell that is involved in the recognition of tumors uh, that have lost HLA class 1. But the fact that we were able to employ 36 markers at the single cell level also allowed uh, the discovery really unexpected findings, such as immune cell subset that had not been previously associated with anti-tumor immune responses in colorectal cancer. Uh, this subset was placed in between NK cells and ILC3s uh, from the phenotypic point of view. It was characterized by CD45RO expression uh, while being CD127 uh, negative, um, really showing the power of mass cytometry um, to provide unexpected findings and to formulate uh, new hypothesis. In the paper, we also showed that these cells carried uh, cytotoxic potential as they expressed a number of proteases and killing inhibitor receptors, and we proposed that this immune cell subset could be potentially involved uh, in the recognition uh, of tumors that have lost uh, HLA class 1 expression together, for instance, with the gamma deltas, which were also uh, expressing uh, PD-1. At a certain point, we asked whether we could actually find these cells um, in the tissue. And with that came some concern uh, that although we were seeing them in a single cell technology, we would actually not be able to show that they were in the tissue. And for that, we developed a panel, um, a multispectral imaging fluorescence panel, uh, to dissect the cells. Unfortunately, we did see 
um, uh, their infiltration in tissues, really on top of epithelial cancer cells, which also nicely correlated with the fact that they expressed markers like CD103. But this really made us uh, think whether we shouldn't move uh, to a discovery setting uh, that is not depending on the processing of tumor tissue at single cell level, but that we can do the discovery immediately uh, at the image level. And I will discuss now some reason for that. I think we do not always appreciate um, that when we do analysis at single cell level, um, that a tissue uh, that was processed um, at some point was selected by uh, possibly a pathologist at the macroscopic level. So there was no uh, uh, really scientific manner to, to provide only tumor tissue and that the tissue was probably impregnated uh, in blood and that in the single cell technologies we will get signatures which are also derived from blood or for instance from healthy tissues. So for instance in our data um, we see a very strong NK cell signal uh, in blood samples and you see a bit of that signal as well in tumor samples and we're pretty confident that this signal is actually coming from the blood uh, that is uh, included in the tissue as we do not see uh, these NK cells if we apply uh, imaging uh, techniques. Also, and these are um, fluorescence images uh, of T cells, um, when we do single cell approaches, uh, we're not able to distinguish where a T cell is sitting, uh, whether it's in the stroma or whether it's on the top of epithelium. And you might have two tumors which have a similar uh, density of T cell infiltration, but in one tumor, there's no intra-epithelial infiltration at all, while in the other tumor, uh, T cells are able to infiltrate uh, the epithelium quite well. And we know that this has uh, uh, consequences also in, from the clinical point of view. So these are the reasons that really made us move um, from single cell mass cytometry to imaging mass cytometry uh, for our discovery approach of our cancer microenvironment studies. Uh, so now we not only do uh, a broad characterization of immune cell subsets that are present in the tumor, um, but we can know what's the relation between them and tumor cells, um, and as well the relation between different immune cell subsets. Uh, so at this point we had to adapt uh, the panel a bit, so it not only contains markers that allow the characterization of immune cell subsets, and now it also makes sense to include some structural markers so that we know where epithelial cells are, where stromal cells are, where blood vessels or lymphoid vessels reside, uh, and as well try to understand what's going on with the cells. Uh, is there an association between uh, immune cell presence and behavior of tumor cells, for instance? So just to show you a few examples of which type of images we obtain with imaging mass cytometry, and it's not possible. Uh, to present all markers in one image, uh, but just to show you what I meant with the structural markers. So in keratin, we can nicely see where the epithelial uh, carcinoma cells are with vimentin. We can type the whole stroma, CD45, the immune cells, and we can localize the vessels uh, with uh, CD31. We can also find out where our PD1 positive cells are uh, if there are other cells and T cells expressing uh, PD-1, how they're interacting with tumor cells and whether they cooperate with other uh, immune cell subsets. And for us, this is really the most exciting part, um, that we correlate the presence of immune cell subsets with the behavior of tumor cells. So for instance, what I show you here is an immune cell marker. Uh, and keratin to show you uh, tumor cells and KI67, that's a, a proliferation marker. So the tumor cells which are KI67 positive are proliferating. And what you see here is a correlation uh, analysis where you see that this specific immune cell subset uh, significantly correlates with tumor cells which are not proliferating. So this really opens ways for us to, to, to functionally characterize uh, the immune cell subsets that we are analyzing in its original context by using tumor cells uh, as a readout. And that's the main objective of employing imaging mass cytometry uh, in the lab. So we went for a 40 marker, marker panel 
um, so 40 antibodies uh, for uh, analysis with imaging mass cytometry and I would like to discuss you or just give you some tips on on how we did this um, so it's very important uh, that you start uh, with very good antibodies that will work just on standard immunochemistry and I should stress that our panel was developed uh, for formalin fixed embedded tissues um, we also have a panel for for frozen tissue but I will only discuss the formalin fixed uh, embedded tissue and generally uh, there is very few overlaps in the antibodies that you can use from one approach or the other so the trick is really to start with with good antibodies that are validated uh, that in the lab you can also validate yourself with immunosochemistry and if they work for immunosochemistry uh, in principle they can also work for mass cytometry uh, so the first thing you have to do uh, is really to check the markers uh, uh, one by one and see how they performed in different antigen retrieval uh, conditions uh, because in principle um, for an easy approach you would like all the antibodies to perform under the same antigen retrieval conditions so that you can detect all the antigens at the same time uh, after this presentation if you're also interested in getting more detail on how we set up the panel I recommend that you check our paper uh, that was recently out describing the whole process in detail something we we realized um, was that antibodies did not perform well um, when we placed them all together in an antibody mix and we just used a one-step incubation uh, for the antibodies and we were playing a bit with what was the best conditions uh, for the antibodies separately as well and what we saw was that antibody antibodies really performed differently uh, for instance if you did a five-hour incubation at room temperature or an incubation overnight uh, at four degrees and not all antibodies performed uh, well in the same condition. So some antibodies prefer being incubated five hours at room temperature, while others would prefer to be incubated at four degrees. And here's an example for some markers where you see uh, a marker that is working well at five hours at room temperature, CD163, while CD3 is performing best uh, overnight at four degrees and uh, FOXP3 uh, as well. We kind of knew that um, to have an optimally performing uh, antibody panel of 40 markers, we would have to separate the antibodies um, into different incubation steps. Uh, but now we, we had a, a logical way of doing so that actually improved uh, the quality of the staining. Um, so we split our antibody mix into two, the two incubation steps, either five hour room temperature or overnight of 40 degrees based on the optimal condition for each antibody. Um, so our protocol consists of, of two days, but it's basically one day. The second day is just washing and adding the DNA intercalator so that you can see the nuclei in the imaging mass cytometry. Uh, so the first day includes all the preparation of the tissue before antibody binding. Uh, and you'll have the five hour room temperature antibody mix after which you wash and you apply overnight uh, the four degree uh, antibody mix. And the next day you wash, you add the DNA intercalator, and you're ready to go. Um, while setting up the panel, we, we faced uh, a few issues, uh, some of which uh, are more serious than others. Um, so a few dim markers that are difficult to detect um, because while in immunosochemistry, you have amplification steps that allow you to bring the signal up. Um, in imaging mass cytometry, there are still few solutions for that although you should consider the use perhaps of secondary antibodies in this setting. Um, the fibrous chancel targets are not detectable in formal and fixed tissue, but this has to do with availability of antibodies to recognize an antigen in its denatured form or native form, and that's why in the lab we also have uh, a frozen uh, panel. And very few antibodies, they didn't survive uh, the labeling process, so we, we ordered the antibodies purified. Uh, we labeled them ourselves and we test their performances uh, before uh, and after labeling. But this is really, it's really a minority. I'll say very few things regarding uh, data analysis because I know this is something uh, that a lot of groups are struggling with, considering, including ourselves. Um, so we do tissue segmentation and we do cell segmentation uh, by making use of the DNA intercalator, keratin, and vimentin signals, which allow us to separate uh, tumor compartments and stroma 
Um, and we do the training of cell masks in elastic and mass creation and cell profiling. And I think a lot of groups uh, are using the same approaches. So after that, we do a HSNE or TSNE, uh, depending on the amount of data you have, uh, base analysis uh, of the samples uh, where we define clusters uh, based uh, on the expression of all the different markers that we have implied in the panel. Um, just a word of advice here, uh, if you have very um, dominant markers like keratin or bimentin, um, which are frequently expressed in the cells and which also vary uh, a lot between different samples, um, you might get a bias where these, these markers are really dominating the way the, the, the TSNE uh, map develops. So you might consider doing the analysis uh, separately uh, for the different compartments um, so that you make use um, of the markers that really are phenotyping your cell uh, to create more diversity in these TSNE analysis. So I mentioned this previously. Um, one of the things we're most interested in is on uh, studying uh, cellular interactions um, and try to understand what's the function of some immune cell subsets based on the behavior of tumor cells, for instance. Uh, and for that, we use a, a software uh, that was developed uh, in Baudivine's Lelyfeld's group, which is Imicite, which is which does basically neighbor neighborhood analysis for, for all the cellular clusters that are identified in images. And it, it just mines the data looking for immune cell subsets uh, that are significantly associated with those uh, from a spatial uh, point of view. And that's where the group is really going in the future to try to establish models uh, of multicellular uh, anti-tumor immune response uh, by being able to analyze all these different immune cell subsets uh, and to be able to place them in the tissue with the imaging, uh, with the imaging approach. I'll just finish it off by thanking uh, uh, the collaborators. Uh, I mentioned the most important ones already in the beginning of the presentation, as well as the generous funding that we have received throughout the years uh, to support the work of the lab. And you can follow our updates with Twitter. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Noel. And now over to Jessica. Hi there, I'm Jessica Simmendinger. Um, I've been working on immunohistochemistry validation at Cell Signaling Technology for 13 years. We've learned so much over the years and our standards for IHC validation have only increased during this time. As traditional singleplex assays evolve into more complex multiplex assays, high quality antibody validation has never been more important than it is today. I'm so grateful to be able to speak to you today regarding the crucial need for antibody specificity in multiplex panels. By multiplex, I'm referring to staining assays that combine two or more antibodies. And as many in this audience are likely aware, such assays can offer tremendous benefits, such as maximal data per tissue section, which can be critical when working with precious and limited human tissue samples. Also, the multiplex assay allows for the understanding of co-expression and spatial organization of multiple targets within preserved tissue architecture, allowing for in-depth study in the field of immuno-oncology and can expand the understanding of the tumor microenvironment. So why is it so important to work with specific and highly validated antibodies? Traditional chromogenic IHC is not typically quantified, so in some cases researchers could ignore or work around some nonspecific signal. That is more of a risk in HyPlex platforms. Combining multiple suboptimal antibodies can significantly confound results. Without sound support for the specificity of each of the antibodies included in a HyPlex assay, how can one have confidence in any discoveries made that are based on antibody staining? For these reasons, we recommend that researchers choose antibodies for use in multiplex assays that are highly validated and have demonstrated specific staining in FFPE tissue models. Some of the topics we'll cover today are what I like to refer to as the principles of IHC validation, our IHC validation toolbox, I'll share a validation vignette on Nectin 2, and then summarizing thoughts. To completely simplify IHC validation, I would ask these two questions. Does the antibody stain where we expect it to? And does it not stain where it should not? If the answers to both questions are yes, then the antibody is specific. That's IHC validation. Simple, right? Then why is it so difficult? Well, two factors come to mind. 
For one, the biology of a particular target, in most cases a protein antigen, it may not be completely understood. So we are charged with proving specificity of an antibody to a protein whose expression patterns in tissues may not be completely elucidated. And for two, we are asking a lot of our IHC antibodies. Yes, we need them to show positive signal, but also they must not stain in numerous different cell types in tissues and multiples of tissue types. Non-tissue-based assays don't ask as much from an antibody as we immunohistochemists do. It is a tall order, and I'll share that the very large majority of antibodies that we test in-house do not pass our strict requirements for an IHC recommendation. As we get into more specifics on IHC validation, please note that the amount or types of IHC validation needed to demonstrate specificity differs for each target and should be tailored to each target. It is not one-size-fits-all. For example, some targets are relatively straightforward. The protein may be well understood, and there may be sound published support for expression. See these examples. GFAP is expected to stain in the brain and peripheral nerves, and that is it. Expected negative tissues should be included in the experimentation. It is not enough to only obtain staining in a positive model. A lack of staining in negative models instills confidence in the specificity of the antibody. Another example is PMEL, a melanoma-specific antigen, and expression of this protein is not expected in other tumor types. This antibody stains the melanoma case, and when tested on multiple other tumor tissues, no staining was observed. We love validations of targets like these. Unfortunately, those types of targets seem fewer and far between. We're working more often on novel targets, which can be more challenging to validate. There may be little published support for expression, perhaps even conflicting reports on protein expression between researchers. I'd like to note that when reviewing IHC staining in the literature, it must be evaluated critically, especially in those instances where strong evidence is not demonstrated for the specificity of the antibodies used. Published data using other assays, including non-antibody-based experimentation, can be quite useful. Sources that provide RNA expression data, such as the Human Protein Atlas, can also help predict expression. For these more difficult targets, an increased variety of validation techniques are typically required. We aim to perform what is scientifically necessary to gain confidence in the specificity of the staining observed. I will now speak more on the specifics of IHC validation that is routinely performed at cell signaling technology. The minimum testing for each antibody in development includes these models. We routinely start with a cell pellet model, testing is performed on one or few tissues, and then the antibody is tested on multiple tissues to assess performance on tissues of expected positive, low, negative, or uncertain levels of expression. And then, well, that depends on the protein target. The following includes a list of additional experimentation that we refer to as tools in our IHC validation toolbox. I will go over each of these in more detail in the slides to come. Note the following statement. No single assay is sufficient to verify specificity of staining. This is an important message. I want to stress that it's not enough that the antibody performs well in one experiment. On one high-low knockout cell model or on one positive-negative tissue model, this does not prove complete specificity. It is the combination of multiple successful assays or tools that helps build the case for specificity. As I mentioned before, most often we start with an FFPE cell pellet model. These cell pellets are fixed, processed, and embedded just like tissue samples. These can be a valuable resource in IHC validation as they serve as a model of known protein expression. In this example, you can see that this clone performs well by Western blot and IHC on cell lines of CD151 positive or negative expression. In this slide, we're demonstrating how different treatments that can modulate expression in FFPE cell pellets can be used in validation. On the top left, UV treatment of OVCAR8 cells is used to induce phosphorylation of histone H2AX. On the top right, rapamycin treatment of LNCAP cells is shown to inhibit expression of phosphos 6 And in the bottom center, UV treatment of HeLa cells translocates the expression of phospho HSP27 from a cytoplasmic localization into the nucleus. In the examples here, we are using cell lines where the protein has been knocked out, see the images on the left, or where the protein expression is notably decreased with siRNA treatment, see the images on the right. These experiments can be quite useful as validation tools combined with other assays. 
A reminder, it is possible to see nonspecific staining in tissues, though the staining results in the cell pellet models were successful. As I mentioned, we routinely start validation with cell pellet models. We often identify multiple clones that stain as expected on cell pellet models, but when we take those samples to tissue models, many samples fail. It's for these reasons that multiple validation experiments must be included. This is an example of testing for cross-reactivity of an antibody in development against its related family members. Such testing is performed for protein targets that share high sequence homology with other proteins. Antibodies directed at receptor tyrosine kinases have a high likelihood of also reacting with related RTKs. Using overexpressed cell models, cell models transfected with related family members EGFR, HER2, HER4, we can show that the anti-HER3 antibody detects just the HER3 protein and does not cross-react with these related proteins. Without performing testing like this, without assurance that the antibody does not cross-react, how can one be certain that the staining in tissues is specific and not related to cross-reactivity of close family member proteins? Now we'll touch more on tissue testing. In this simple example, we are validating an antibody that should be specific to smooth muscle. We use a tissue that contains both positive and negative elements. It has its own internal control. One can see positive staining in vascular smooth muscle and no staining in the surrounding cardiac muscle. Here I'd like to show how we are able to leverage public RNA expression data to aid in validation. The RNA information available in the Human Protein Atlas can aid in predicting tissues and cell models of high, low, or no expression. The staining of the CD39 antibody correlates well with the tissues of high-low RNA per Human Protein Atlas. Some other available resources that can provide useful target-related information include BioGPS, Phosphocyte, or Uniprop. We've had an increased focus on producing mouse-reactive antibodies that work for IHC, and so we've generated multiple rodent models to aid in the validation of these targets. As with the human reactive antibodies, we will test the mouse reactive antibodies in various normal mouse tissues and syngeneic tumor models. In the examples here, you can see we were able to modulate protein expression in these models using treatments. Treatment with rapamycin was performed, which inhibits phosphos 6 expression. There are tools used to assess protein modifications that I'd like to mention here. On the left is an example of a lambda phosphatase treatment. This is performed for all antibodies in development directed at phosphorylated proteins. Please note that a successful result, a lack of staining in the lambda phosphatase treated tissue section, does not prove specificity to the protein target. What it does is show that the antibody is phospho-specific. I want to continue to stress that multiple experiments are needed to demonstrate specificity. On the right is a peptide blocking experiment. These types of experiments can help us to validate antibodies directed at other protein modifications, such as methylation or acetylation. This antibody is directed at histone H3 when trimethylated at lyc lysine 36. To demonstrate specificity to this particular protein modification, we performed a peptide blocking experiment where the primary antibody was incubated with 10x by weight of a histone H3 peptide sequence that does include the lysine 36 though is not methylated. That is the section on the left, and you can see nice strong nuclear staining, so the antibody is not blocked from binding. On the right, you can see that there is no staining when the antibody is incubated with the trimethyl lysine 36 peptide. This helps to confirm that the antibody detects this specific modification. Orthogonal support of expression using tools that are not antibody-based can be valuable in IHC validation. Such assays include mass spectrometry and RNA-seq or RNA-scope. For some protein targets, we've been able to use mass spec to identify tissues of high, low, or no protein expression. In this example, a cohort of human small cell lung carcinoma tissues was assessed for DLL3 expression. Tissues chosen from that analysis were then stained with an anti-DLL3 clone. The staining observed correlates to the levels of expected expression per mass spec, giving us increased confidence in the specificity of this antibody for IHC. Co-localization experimentation is another tool to support specificity. It can be difficult, especially when working with immuno-oncology-related targets that are often expressed on immune cells, to confidently note precisely what cell types are staining. In these cases, an assay that shows co-localization to a particular immune cell CD marker can provide confidence that the staining is being observed in the expected cell type. So in this example, CD11C is a dendritic cell marker. 
The XCR1 antibody shows co-expression with CD11C on a subset of dendritic cells, as we would expect. Two antigen support. Performing staining using antibodies directed at different epitopes is one of the best validation tools that we have available. In the case of NOTCH2, we expected to see membranous staining and also some nuclear signal representative of active NOTCH. But how can we be certain that the distribution and the level of nuclear staining is appropriate? Fortunately, we were able to develop another clone that is directed at a different portion of the protein, also within the intracellular domain. Since the two antibodies detect independent, unique epitopes on human NOTCH2, and they show the same staining pattern on multiple cell and tissue models, we can now have increased confidence in the specificity of all of the staining observed. Confirmation of species reactivity is important to include if an antibody is predicted to work in additional species. Two SHMT2 antibodies were developed. They showed nice staining in multiple human models. The localization is mitochondrial as expected, and since the antibodies are directed at distinct portions of the human SHMT2 protein, we have increased confidence in the performance of these antibodies on human models. Both antibodies are predicted to react with mouse based on western blot testing and also considering the high sequence homology with the related sequence in mouse. When tested in mouse, both clones did show mitochondrial staining in some tissues, as we would expect, such as mouse spleen. However, both show additional nonspecific signal of different patterns. The top clone shows prominent nuclear signal in a subset of immune cells. The bottom clone shows diffuse cytoplasmic signal in pancreatic acinar cells. Note that these antibodies did not show similar nonspecificity in human tissues. It appears to be a mouse species-specific issue. Therefore, these antibodies are not suitable for mouse staining. Now I'd like to share a short summary of IHC validation for a recently released Nectin-2 clone. A high-low cell model was chosen in part through RNA information available via the Human Protein Atlas. This cell model looked good by Western blot, and there was nice membranous staining in the high-expressing RT4 cells and light signal in the low-expressing HDLM2 cells. There is strong support for testes expression, as well as in vessel endothelial cells. We observe staining consistent with those reports. The clone was tested on multiple other human normal and tumor tissues. There are a number of publications showing Nectin-2 expression increased in cancerous versus normal tissues. Though based on human protein atlas RNA data and other published literature, there can be expression in some normal tissues as well. The clone did show staining in normal tissues, testes of course, and others, including kidney and gastrointestinal tissues. We also observed staining in multiple tumors. Note the colon carcinoma image, as well as the concentration-matched ice-type control. So while the staining pattern does seem reasonable, how can we be confident that all of the staining observed is appropriate and is actually Nectin-2 specific? The clone we have been validating is directed at the extracellular domain of the human Nectin-2 protein. We were able to develop another antibody that recognizes an epitope in the intracellular domain. This second antibody showed similar staining results in testes, endothelial cells, and in some tumors. We then performed side-by-side -side staining on multiple human tumor and normal tissues. Using tissue microarrays and whole tissue blocks, we observed a matching staining pattern on all models. With this strong support, we feel confident in the specificity of this antibody. Some closing thoughts. IHC validation is target dependent and should include what is needed to support specificity of that target. It is not one size fits all. A toolbox of validation techniques can and should be employed. No one assay is sufficient to demonstrate specificity. We like to say that the use of multiple validation tools is a synergistic combination. The whole is greater than its parts. Each antibody included in a multiplex assay should first be shown to be specific on its own. Highly validated antibodies are crucial in these assays to produce reliable staining results which can enable the researcher to make discoveries with confidence. Thank you so much for your time and your attention. Please feel free to reach out to us anytime for more information. Thank you. Thank you. You were listening to Noel de Miranda, Principal Investigator of the Immunogenomics Group at Leiden University Medical Center in the Netherlands, and Jessica Simendinger, 
Research and Development Supervisor in the Immunohistochemistry Group at Cell Signaling Technology. Thank you both for your presentations. It is now time for the question and answer session. To ask the speakers a question, just type it in where it says, type your questions here, and then press submit. So, our first question asks, what characteristics should I be looking for in IHC antibodies? Jessica, would you like to answer that question? Yes, of course, thank you. Um, ideally, the vendor will show convincing validation data on the website and on the data sheets. Um, that would include multiple FFPE tissues, um, ideally positive and negative models. Um, at CFT, you should be looking for the the IHC recommendation to be um, to be uh, noted at the top. Um, if a product has the IHC recommendation, then we stand by our um, validation of that product. If it doesn't hold the IHC recommendation, we are welcome to take questions from customers um, as to why that product is not recommended. We'll share any and all validation and testing um, history that was performed with a certain um, antibody. And um, yeah, basically I would look for something that's well validated and um, that you can have confidence in. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. And one further question for you. How do I find antibodies that will be compatible with this system? Yes, um, Noel did mention that um, most antibodies should be compatible, and you do want to choose an antibody that you feel has been well validated. So if you do have an antibody in your lab that you can feel confident in the performance in FFPE tissues, um, then it should work in the system. I, I believe you need a um, PBS formulation to make it compatible. And um, at, at least at Cell Signaling Technology, there is a, um, on the main web page, there is a, a, something you can click in regards to inquiring about a custom formulation. But so any of our IHC recommended antibodies can be purchased as a, as a custom PBS formulation. Thank you very much. And Thank now you. one for Noel. Uh, this question asks, is there still a role for single cell mass cytometry or has your lab now switched to running imaging mass cytometry? Uh, yes, yeah. thank you very much for, for the question. Um, there's definitely still a role for, for single cell uh, mass cytometry, uh, particularly if you're working uh, with liquid samples, uh, either being liquid malignancies, uh, uh, blood, or characterization of in vitro cultures that require uh, high uh, multiplexing. Uh, our lab is mostly working with solid malignancies, so for us there's really a much added value uh, of uh, getting the information as well on the location of the cell, so we're doing a lot of imaging mass cytometry, but we often also process uh, uh, tissues like blood uh, from the same patients, and that we'll do uh, by single cell mass cytometry. And it's important to keep in mind that uh, most likely you will have to use different antibodies uh, or clones in an imaging mass cytometry setting that you use FFP material, for instance, uh, from a, a single cell uh, mass cytometry with the native uh, proteins. Okay, thank you. Our next question asks, uh, what do you think is the next big technological step in multiplex imaging? Uh, Noel? Um, so there are a couple of things that we are uh, uh, looking uh, forward. Uh, um, uh, one of those is that to really increase the resolution of the technologies that use high plex uh, detection, like imaging mass cytometry, so that we can actually start looking at intracellular uh, localization markers uh, in detail. Um, a second thing would be uh, to reliably combine uh, the detection of protein uh, and uh, RNA species, and some work has been done there already, particularly by the Bode-Miller uh, lab. And a third thing that I would envision is that these technologies uh, really increase in their uh, data acquisition speed so that they can go from low throughput, high data generating platforms towards high throughput, uh, high data uh, being generated, a high amount of data. Thank you very much. Um, just a quick reminder to our live audience, you still have time to ask a question. Uh, to ask a question, just type it in where it says type your questions here and then press 
submit. Our next question asks, how often do you find that an unconjugated antibody works well in tissue, but the metal conjugated antibody fails in the Hyperion assay? And do you have a sense of the source of failure? Noel? Uh, yeah, so um, so from, from the publication I, I refer to, I can say that the majority of antibodies that we tested in immunosochemistry, they kept working on imaging mass cytometry. Um, and then if they stop working, normally there are two reasons for it. Um, and the most common is that um, that antibody is attacking an antigen um, that is not uh, very uh, abundant um, because IMC does not have a, 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 um, amplification of signal, uh, so there might be some issues with detecting uh, dim markers. And Sometimes, but this is a rather uh, a rare event, I think we saw it in one or two antibodies, uh, the labeling process um, might uh, destroy the binding capacity of the antibody. But by far, uh, the majority of antibodies uh, have worked uh, when transitioning from IHC uh, to IMC, and I think a large uh, part of that is due to the fact that we chose uh, good antibodies uh, to start with. Okay, thank you. Our next question, do antibodies perform differently when conjugated to different metals? Um, yeah, so if you look at the spectrum of heavy metals uh, that you can use uh, for the imaging mass cytometry system, you'll see that some heavy metals, uh, they provide a stronger signal. Uh, so what you want to do is put antigens uh, that are more difficult to detect um, with the metals uh, that provide a stronger signal in the, the mass uh, spectrometry. So there's definitely uh, something to account uh, uh, there, and I'm happy to provide uh, uh, details later. Thank you very much. Our next question asks, does cell signaling provide the antibody raw testing data or result and experimental methods in a searchable database such as the Human Protein Atlas? Well, we do not have a separate searchable database as the Human Protein Atlas does have. Um, we have made a concerted effort, however, in recent years to put more and more IHC um, testing data onto the website, and that is a process that is currently underway, and we constantly are, are adding to that um, with each new product. We, um, we can also share any additional testing um, information with, with a customer at any point. You can feel free to contact us via our tech support line, and we are always open to share all validation data for products we do recommend and for products we also don't recommend. Thanks very much, uh, Jess. Um, a further question asks, what strategy do you recommend for IMC antibody validation? Um, so what we normally do, we always compare immunohistochemistry and IMC side by side. And for that, we use a tissue that is very enriched in immune cells, like tonsils, uh, because uh, our biggest focus is uh, on cancer immunity. Um, and then we inspect uh, the immunostochemistry signal, and we put it side by side uh, with the uh, imaging mass cytometry signal. And we want to see uh, the same cell staining. Uh, so if you are staining, for instance, for a B-cell marker, you want to see the signal coming from the journal center in the IMC. And you also want to see the same uh, magnitude of detection, so the amount of cells that are being detected uh, by one method uh, and the other. Thank you. A quick reminder to our live audience, you still have time to ask a question. To ask a question, just type it in where it says type your questions here and then press submit. Our next question asks, which research domains Mass cyto is mass cytometry very popular in? Um, so it, it's, it's, it's been very popular uh, in immunology-related fields uh, because you really need the high plexing capacity uh, to, define, to, define very specific, uh, uh, to define very specific subsets. Um, we're now transitioning uh, a bit towards uh, cell signaling where we combine markers um, that inform us about the phenotype of cells and also their, 
their activation state, for instance, or which signaling pathways are activated in those. But it's it's been really popular in the immunology field. Thanks, Noel. Um, the next question asks, what kind of antibody should be used for mass cytometry? Should it be polyclonal, monoclonal, or recombinant? Um, so in our panel, we have... Uh, polyclonals and, and monoclonals. We generally prefer monoclonals because those are more likely uh, to be more specific, and I think most of the new generation antibodies are monoclonal. We, But we haven't faced main major issues in labeling different type of antibodies. We even have IgM uh, antibodies, for instance, working uh, in imaging uh, mass cytometry. Okay, thank you. Our next question asks, there are two questions, how expensive are the antibody panel and uh, how are the antibodies labeled for mass cytometry? Um, yeah, so the, the the price tag will depend, of course, you, you have to sum up uh, um, the price of the antibodies plus the, the, the labeling kits or whether you acquire uh, the antibodies uh, directly labeled. Uh, the way we're using, uh, the way we we went for it is that we acquire the purified antibodies in PBS uh, formulation, and we use a, a kit provided by by Fluidime uh, to label uh, those uh, antibodies. Thank you. A quick reminder to our live audience: you still have time to ask a question. To ask a question, just type it in where it says, type your questions here, and then press submit. Our next question uh, how asks, how do you ensure that an antibody performs similarly when stained alone versus when applied in the context of a high-plex panel? Um, so what we did for, for IMC is that, so I, I referred to this uh, some minutes ago, um, is that we compared side by side the immunohistochemistry image with an IMC generated image. And we only select the marker of interest to observe uh, its localization and the amount of cells that is staining. And we generally uh, use tonsils as tissue to make that comparison. And we expect to find the same amount of cells that we found in the IHC, in the IMC. And if we do, we consider that antibody has been performing well in the IMC, and we can uh, proceed with it. Thank you very much for that clarification. Our next question asks, is there a specific process to manufacture specific antibodies for mass cytometry? Um, so, I would say the most important uh, feature is that you get antibodies uh, in PBS uh, formulation if you want to label them yourself, or you can acquire them directly labeled. Uh, but if you if you want to do the labeling yourself, what's important is that there are not other protein constituents um, in the antibody uh, solution, so that it doesn't interfere uh, with the labeling. Thank you very much. Our next question asks, are there any good published papers or freely available information as to the best way to analyze IMC data? Yeah, so I would I would definitely recommend to check the publications from Bowdoin Miller's lab. Uh, they develop a number of, of, of tools and they've described in detail um, on how to perform uh, IMC analysis and they also regularly organized uh, uh, courses uh, to make use of their uh, tools. Thank you very much. Uh, a further question asks, what blocking solution did you use for IMC staining? Uh, we use a super blocking uh, a solution uh, from uh, Thermo Fisher, and you can find details on the solution um, in our publication uh, that was referred to in the presentation. Great. Thank you for that. And a further question asks, what is a good available analysis platform for mass cytometry? Yeah, so I said before, um, the Bottom Miller Lab particularly has developed a, a number of nice tools uh, to be able uh, to handle imaging mass cytometry um, uh, data uh, like HistoCat. Um, and also the what's very important is the, the, the cellular segmentation of tools that you have to apply beforehand. But if you check the papers uh, from his lab, they describe the whole process from cellular segmentation to quantification uh, phenotypes in the tissues. 
Okay, thank you. We have five minutes left. A reminder to our live audience, you still just about have time to ask a question. To ask a question, just type it in where it says type your questions here and then press submit. Uh, the next question asks, what solution did you use for preparing the IMC antibody cocktail? Yeah, so we, we use a, a PBS a twin uh, solution to mix the antibodies. And if you notice in the presentation, we, we split the antibodies in two incubation steps. Um, that seemed to be very important that you do not have too much uh, of antibodies in uh, too many antibodies in solution, and there is some space uh, uh, for the buffer. But we use PBS uh, twin also to help a bit. The twin is there to help a bit with the specificity of the antibody binding. Thank you very much. I think that we will stop there for today. I would just like to thank Noel and Jessica for their presentations and for answering your questions. I would also like to thank the webcast sponsor, Cell Signaling Technology, and of course you, the audience, for taking the time to be with us today. Remember, you can watch this webcast again at any time on demand at nature.com webcasts. Thanks for watching, and I hope you'll join us again soon.